See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns come? So rich a crown. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The events we remember at Easter have an unrelenting quality about them. Quite apart from the build-up of tension in Jerusalem, the compassionate significance of every word uttered during the Last Supper, and the anguish and torment of the evening in Gethsemane, from the time of his arrest, the torture and punishment are unrelenting upon Jesus. The scourging, the beating, the mocking, the trial over the night, and then here we are at the place called the Skull, where Jesus is hanged upon a cross for all the world to see. We condemn regimes that engage in this sort of brutality. We jail individuals who think they can do this to the body of someone else. And yet, here we see legalized, sanctioned violence. Here we see the planned degradation by society of people they no longer want to have to deal with. Here we see the brutalized and degraded body of our Lord. And it was all done publicly. Without embarrassment or shame, those emotions were the, were the curse of the condemned, for that is what crucifixion meant. Utter degradation and shame hanging there hour after hour, sometimes for days, while everyone gawped at you, ridiculed you, were appalled at you. Why would a new religion pick such a figure as this to stand at its head? This moment, when all the sadistic impulses of humanity were drawn to Jesus, was exactly what he had come for. He came to absorb all that was awful in those around him. Beneath the cross of Jesus were the soldiers who had beaten him, the priests who had condemned him, the Roman authorities who had sentenced him, the crowd of ordinary folk who had rejected his ways and bade for his blood. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive the soldiers. Father, forgive the priests. Father, forgive the authorities. Father, forgive the crowds of ordinary folk. Father, forgive us who stand beneath your cross today knowing that every wrong word, every mean action, every opportunity for good passed by nails you to that cross.
They say you know a person by the company they keep. After having spent all his ministry hanging out with the flotsam and jetsam of Palestine, the tax collectors, the fishermen, the prostitutes and beggars, now our Lord hangs between two criminals, two bandits, two violent men who preyed on others for a career. It seemed perverse, but scripture always said that our God would be numbered among the transgressors, and so here he hangs. And we know the all-encompassing love of our God as his arms stretch out to embrace us. But which side of Jesus do we hang on? We know a part of our God's nature by the company he keeps at this crucial time, but we will be known too by the company we keep and the understanding of that company we have when things finally come to a matter of life and death. You see, hanging on one side of Jesus, we really don't know him at all. We mock him as a fake Messiah, unable to save himself because we can't see how God can look like this man hanging next to us. A self-sacrificial God is not worth anything to us. We want no part of any kingdom this God may bring. But if we hang on the other side of Jesus, well, then we let the scales fall from our eyes. We put two and two together and we recognize a king not ruling by signs and wonders, although we know from others he's more than able to do them, not ruling by magic and dazzlement or by shock and awe. No, we see God come to take on death by passing through all that causes it and crushing the one that holds us in the grip of sin. We see a kingdom that we want to live in. And we ask that in his power, Jesus remembers us when he comes into his kingdom. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All loving things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That cry of dereliction, a cry that should cause us to tremble in awe at its awfulness and at the awesome determination it draws from the depths of God to save us. As we look upon Jesus this evening, as we hear his words, we see the full force of the curse meted out on him. Cursed by society, the cross was the cruelest punishment the Romans ever figured out. And the Jewish scriptures wrote, cursed is everyone who hangs upon the tree. But most horrifically cursed by God the Father, cursed with the shocking weight of the curse that took us out of Eden, took us out of the presence of God himself. God the Son clothed himself in the stinking rags of our sin that day. And God the Father in all his holiness could not look upon the one with whom he shared eternity and the world went cold as Satan smelled victory and why for love of us to bear the curse that ties us to death in our sinfulness and holds us forever and all eternity away from the presence of God the moment is awful and should cause us to tremble but we're not looking at God punishing the Son we're looking at God the Father and God the Son working together to find the only way out for the world they created, for the people they love. Together they take the consequences of our rebellion and break the chain that binds us to our just end. So in this cry of dereliction, in this heart-stopping, universe-ripping moment of forsakenness, we see a depth of love, a commitment to mercy that causes us to tremble.
it is finished, cried out Jesus. Not, I am finished. Not, I've had enough, I've reached the end of what I can bear. But it is finished, in the way a new house is finished, when all the snagging is done. Finished as in completely and utterly perfected. But in order for it to be finished that day on the cross, something must have been finished before. And that thing was the consequence of sin that rolled down the ages. Sin that led inexorably from one day to the next of messed up good intentions, until each person's final day brought death. It was held in check to some extent by the blessing of the law. An awful lot of people were spared the worst pain of humanity's inhumanity, because most of us allowed the law to check us like a check chain on one of our dogs makes it think twice about racing off in the wrong direction. But the law itself is a reminder of our eternal slavery to death, for we none of us keep any law completely. We none of us abide even by our own best intentions, let alone the collective good intentions of any societal law. And so the scripture provided for the necessary regular atonement, the shedding of blood to show the seriousness with which we took our failings. But then God stepped into history and not only showed us how to live, but also a new way of dying, so that the chains binding us to eternal death could be broken if we bind ourselves to God in his death, so that the complete sacri so that the incomplete sacrifices made over the generations could be made complete, perfect, finished in Jesus. So what now? If before Jesus there was no finished, completed reconciliation with God, and then Jesus said, it is finished, where do we stand now? Well, if we stand alongside Jesus, if we come to God through him, then we plead his sacrifice on our behalf, and there is nothing in this life that finishes us, nothing that can cause us to say, I've had it, I'm finished because there is nothing in this life that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, said Jesus. Looking on from the foot of the cross, this is the bleakest and blackest of moments. Our Lord himself succumbing to death. And yet in all the physical agony of crucifixion, not only has Jesus had the compassion to reach out to the man next to him with words of power and comfort, now he chooses to exercise his last breath by quoting a psalm. And not only quoting a psalm, but applying it personally. The words of the songbook of his childhood taught him to say, into my hands I commit my spirit. Eternity with God himself taught him to say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's a significant addition. As few in his age or in the ages before, according to scripture, felt close enough to the transcendent God to call him Father. But in Christ, God is not just transcendent, that is all powerful, almighty, awesome, holy, completely beyond us. He is now what theologians call imminent. He is close to us, identified with us. He is wrapped in humanity so that we can know him better, know him personally, know him as father. Which is maybe why we use these words at funerals, committing our bodies to the ground, to earth and to ash and our spirits to God, or clothing in a new body having had God among us, showing us how to live in perfect peace with him, to live according to his ways, to live an abundant life, we're now able to commit ourselves to his eternal care 
and keeping. But actually, for Christians, we come to this point of death long before we die. We only come to God at all by coming through the death of Jesus, by asking that his death be our death, so that his resurrection life be our life. So the moment we come in faith to Christ is the moment when he conquered death for us. And that is the moment when we commit our spirits into the Father's hands for all eternity. For today we remember the blackest and bleakest of moments. But it is also the moment when the path opens wide to eternal life. The moment when we are gifted the eternal security of our spirits held safe in the Father's hands. May Good Friday feel really good today because you know you have committed your spirit into the hands of your Heavenly Father and there's no better place to be. Where the whole realm of nature mine that so amazing, so divine, demands my soul.